So my name's Aaron Levo. I'm the Vice President of People, Culture and Communications. Uh, happy to be playing a moderating role for today's town hall. Uh, and we have a, a, a solid agenda today of information and updates for everyone that's able to join. Recognizing some can't join the live town hall, uh, it will be recorded and available on the hub. So please let your colleagues know if you hear something that you think they should know about, and may, uh, if you could put it to them to look it up and, and view it at their at, when they're able, that's great. And uh, an email will go out to everyone as usual. So a little housekeeping before we start, just to remind everyone that we will have the Q&A function available for questions throughout the presentations today. So if something comes to mind related to what you're hearing, or, or maybe not, any questions you may have, post them in the Q&A function and our panelists will do their very best to type an answer. If we don't get an answer uh, to your question today, either because uh, the right person wasn't available or maybe we ran out of time, then we will keep those questions and email you a response uh, where we're able. So make sure that your name is there so we know who's asking the question and then can send a response. Uh, please, let's leave the chat uh, function uh, free of questions. We'll use that for celebrations at the end of our town hall today. So as we as we go through the agenda today, please think about those things that you might want to celebrate or call out uh, when we get to that portion of our agenda. It's always an uplifting moment and a chance for us to recognize our colleagues and excellence going on all across the hospital. So Q&A for questions, chat for celebrations. That's about it for me. I'll uh, invite our president and CEO, Rob McIsaac, to kick things off. Rob, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Aaron. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for joining uh, today's town hall. As always, I'm going to start by acknowledging that we are privileged to provide care on lands that Indigenous peoples have called home for thousands of years. We recognize and respect the presence and stewardship of all Indigenous peoples as keepers of this land. Um, as communicated earlier this week, uh, by email, several of our sites have been experiencing really extreme uh, pressures in recent days in terms of uh, occupancy, volumes. Um, there are a number of factors contributing to the situation, including uh, very high ALC numbers, but also uh, high patient acuity. Uh, and of course, it's all exacerbated uh, by ongoing staffing challenges. Uh, of course, uh, this comes with the onset of uh, uh, um, flu season or infectious respiratory disease season, uh, which is already beginning to impact on our operations. So uh, I know it's very uh, challenging times. Hospital leadership uh, has been meeting on a daily basis to monitor uh, and problems solve around the situation to the extent that's possible. Uh, I would say the immediate goal is to try to uh, get some stability, uh, at least for the next few days and through uh, the upcoming long weekend. So uh, Sharon is going to, Sharon Pearson will provide a more in-depth uh, update on hospital operations in a few moments, but uh, wanted to acknowledge um, how hard everyone is working across HHS to maintain safe quality patient care during this period of surge. Uh, and I know that includes many of the people on this call uh, who have stepped forward to put in extra hours, cover shifts on short notice, uh, et cetera. I think the other uh, big thing, I'm sure there'll be more call outs uh, before um, this session is over, but uh, my I wanna extend my personal thanks uh, and congratulations to everybody at HHS on another uh, completing another accreditation cycle. We got some very uh, positive feedback from the surveyors, so that was really encouraging. And I was personally impressed with the preparedness of our teams, especially uh, considering what we've come through these past few years and how busy we've been um, as an organization even during the past year. Uh, we expect to hear from Accreditation Canada with our official ranking uh, in the near future. And so um, I'll look forward to sharing uh, that final result and recommendations with all of you. 
As always, uh, we're going to start off with Sharon uh, Pearson on operations, but we have a full slate of other topics, including um, an epidemiological update from our old friend, Dr. Mertz, uh, an EDI update, news on uh, My Voice Matters, and of course, uh, as Aaron has uh, detailed, a chance to celebrate uh, some accomplishments. So, uh, Sharon, over to you to get things going. Uh, thanks, Rob, and uh, good morning, everyone. Rob provided a really nice introduction to my uh, operational update today, so uh, set the stage well. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, indeed, uh, the flu season, uh, our surge season is upon us. Uh, you can see previously, you know, pre-summer, I was reporting no COVID patients or, or perhaps in the, the less than uh, two-digit numbers. We now have 86 patients. Some of those uh, COVID positivity uh, patients uh, are attributable to our outbreaks. Uh, we have less than five patients in the ICU. No current COVID outbreaks. We do have other uh, outbreaks within the organization. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, that is having an impact uh, on the occupancy this um, incoming flu season. We are seeing those pressures across our adult and our acute sites. You can see where we're sitting in terms of occupancy. The aggregate is 100. The adult acute is 105. We were at 117 at the Jurovinsky site, 108 at the general site uh, on some days over the course of the last week. So particularly high uh, at, at our larger adult sites. Um, from, a, from a children's perspective, certainly ongoing pressures with the pediatric population along with our neonatal uh, population. And we're seeing those uh, pressures across the province, but they are particularly pronounced at McMaster Children's Hospital. Uh, and as Rob indicated, some of these pressures are attributable to the increase in the influenza, the patient acuity, uh, but certainly we are seeing that creep in the ALC numbers. So today we see 253 patients, 120 of those would be in the satellite uh, health facility. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so I highlighted uh, the, the pressure. Certainly we are having to use surge staffing levels of care in our inpatient units as a result. There's lots of mitigating strategies in place uh, to compensate for the pressures that we're seeing right now. I'll talk about uh, a couple of those in a minute. We are using all of our unfunded uh, and our uh, unconventional spaces in order to manage that capacity. Uh, certainly the outbreaks do contribute when we're not able to admit to those units and working with our infectious diseases partners uh, to optimize capacity wherever we can, uh, to maximize wherever we can. Uh, and just as we're seeing in the community, the increase in the influenza and COVID, certainly our staff are experiencing that as well. So we are seeing that uh, uptick in our staff uh, absences as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the stabilization in terms of uh, mitigating for these pressures, be they bed pressures or staff pressures, as always using all of our resources as effectively as we can be at the satellite St. Peter's uh, and our other um, post-acute locations such as regional rehab. And those teams are wor working inordinately hard uh, to ensure those patients coming from acute are received uh, as quickly as possible into the post-acute beds. Working in partnership with our home and community care partners, I've identified previously just as the acute care sector is struggling with HHR issues, so are our home care partners as well, doing the best that they are able to do. Within long-term care, they are experiencing an increase in their COVID uh, outbreak. So there are a number of long-term care homes that are not able to admit right now. So that is impacting those ALC numbers in the discharge of those ALC patients waiting for long-term care, which is about 75 to 80 patients at HHS. Our surgical uh, partners and teams within the organization, as always, are maximizing our same-day home and our same-day overnight activity. Uh, and certainly wherever we can, we're expanding our virtual and remote uh, care options uh, for our patients. Uh, we have been meeting daily as leaders, physician and administrative leaders, 
uh, across the organization internally, but also externally working with partners uh, to mitigate the pressures that we feel across our respective sites within HHS and all of the work that we've highlighted here in the town hall with respect to the workforce planning uh, is continuing, be that the externs, the extenders, the IENs, uh, the NGGs, uh, lots of different strategies in place to support the care model. Uh, and then just lastly, certainly we are advancing our vaccine uh, rollout for this year, as are all hospitals and parts of the health sector. Uh, there'll be the uh, patient delivery starting on October 11th, uh, and we are working on the staff uh, and physician rollout for the following or the next following week. So more to come. Uh, you'll see a communication uh, next week regarding uh, staff and physicians. Uh, and then last slide. Uh, I would just echo Rob's comments. Uh, sincerely grateful. I do know that the situation can feel very untenable at times uh, in the clinical areas, and we do appreciate everyone's hard work and certainly those that are stepping up uh, and helping us out in these times. So very appreciative. And with that, I'll hand it back to Aaron. Yeah, thanks very much, Sharon, for the update. Um, okay, next on our agenda is Dr. Dominic Mertz, who's our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, to talk a little bit more about where we are today in terms of respiratory viral season and what we need to know. Dominic, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Giving an update what changed over the last uh, roughly four weeks, uh, locally and regionally, and um, touching on the impact of respiratory viruses on healthcare, but you've already heard about this to some extent. Next slide. Um, here you see the number of COVID positive patients in hospital. And as Sharon uh, previously mentioned of the cases that we have in healthcare, um, a significant proportion is as a consequence of outbreaks. So they are new admits from the community. Those were patients who got COVID unfortunately during the hospital stay. When you're looking at the the numbers of patients who are COVID positive and in the healthcare setting across HNHB here, you can see that we are very similar um, currently as we would have been exactly 12 months ago, uh, end of September, beginning of October. On the next slide, we look more specifically at Hamilton. Um, Hamilton, we've peaked over the last two, well, I shouldn't say we've peaked, we plateaued over the last two weeks, uh, thanks to uh, no longer having that many outbreaks to some extent as well. Three three weeks ago, roughly, we, we run into multiple outbreaks and that outbreak activity had significantly reduced since. And again, in Hamilton, we are in a similar range as we would have been exactly one year ago uh, going into respiratory virus season. Next slide. Last slide from what I recall, that's COVID specific, okay. looking at number of outbreaks. Um, that's Ontario wide, and you can see we are in a better state than we've been uh, September, beginning of October last year. As you can see here, uh, hospital outbreaks are the orange ones here. The majority, as always or often, is in long term care, and uh, that's red, and the turquoise is retirement homes. Next slide. No, I'm not done with COVID yet. My apologies. Um, the Hamilton Public Health uh, Services data I wanted to show today as well, because I'm not going to show you any data from Australia again. Um, the wastewater signal, again, gives us a similar picture as we've seen last year around the same time, relatively stable over the last couple of weeks and in the same range as it used to be uh, 12 months ago. Next slide. And looking at here, uh, this is only Hamiltonian, so pay, uh, patients or people captured by Hamilton Public Health Services. And I highlighted in yellow here the same period of time last year. Uh, on, to on top, you have a number of deaths, significantly less COVID-related deaths than a year ago, keeping in mind there's sometimes a delay with reporting, so it may not be as flat of a curve as it, as it currently is eventually. Hospitalized cases in the next, you do see an increase there in over the last few weeks at the very right hand side, but much, uh, not much less, but less though than uh, 12 months ago. And ICU is still a rare occurrence at this point that the patient requires 
ICU care because of COVID and less so than a year ago. Next slide. Now broadening scope to all respiratory viruses. Um, you've seen this previously. It shows you how many patients uh, present to the ED with respiratory uh, tract symptoms. And you can see that maybe other than in the age group of 18 to 64, there's the to be, to be expected increase going into September. Um, and again, not very different from what we would have seen last year or pre-pandemic as well. Uh, in the September. Next slide. What do we see currently? This is data from our uh, lab colleagues at the HRLMP, Hamilton-specific data, so for the Hamilton hospitals. It, if you currently have a respiratory tract infection, it's most likely either rhinoenterovirus. We had 217 cases diagnosed within a week, or it's COVID where we had 198 cases uh, um, identified over the last week. And the other viruses listed here are sporadic still, so flu, uh, paraflu, or RSV, where we are already at 17, but still that's considered um, sporadic at this point. Next slide. What's going on at the... Um, McMaster Children's Hospital, where we typically see one of the largest impacts in terms of respiratory tract infections. Black line shows you the total numbers of patients with a respiratory or viral respiratory infection. Yellow is rhinoenterovirus, really driving the bus at this point of time in terms of admissions. In red, you see RSV and in uh, gray, COVID-19. Next slide. Now, I, last time I, I spoke at Town Hall, I was asked to um, use the crystal ball to, to predict when we are going to see an increase in respiratory viral infections, in particular RSV and flu. What we can do at this point is to look at the US because, uh, for example, the flu is typically coming uh, up from the south. Uh, the more red, the, the more influenza-like infections or illness is being identified in the states here in the US. And you can see it's still predominantly green. Um, and this here is how it looked like in October 1, 2022. So that's the comparison from last year. Um, and when you move to the current year on the next slide, you see even more green. Um, the um, the, the one outlier here is New York City. So the question really is, will it spread from New York City and hit this earlier? Or can we expect that first um, the US will get more red and red going from south to north, north and then we will see uh, our flu and RSV cases to switch from sporadic to um, more seasonal epidemic. Next slide. So bottom line is COVID activity is currently relatively stable after an increase throughout September and comparable to one year ago. So I would say a modest increase is what we've seen. Uh, rhinoenterovirus is in the process of peaking, RSV and flu still sporadic at this point. The US data at this point, to the extent we can predict something based on that, would suggest that we will not peak as early as we did last year in terms of flu and RSV when we peaked already in November, which was very unusual. In terms of policy changes, just, just a reminder, the obvious change uh, that we've made uh, since the last town hall was masking in clinical areas. There's other more minor policy changes that um, are coming. Please. Um, yeah, please make sure that, that you read the news on the hub that will provide you with that information. There's some changes pending in terms of return to work rules, as well as around the duration of isolation for COVID positives and um, COVID exposed patients. Um, that's all for me today. Handing back to you, Aaron. Okay, thanks very much, Dominic, for the update. Very informative, as always. Uh, next on our agenda regarding a very important project for the collection of health equity data is Rochelle Reed, our senior lead and strategic advisor for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Rochelle, what do we need to know about this work? Thank you, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. 
I'm happy to provide an update on the progress of our health equity data collection work that's been identified as a key in-year priority. So as part of our overarching EDI plan and our commitments to collecting health equity data, we've launched a pilot to begin defining what our process will look like in terms of equity data collection. We're leveraging the campaign, We Ask Because We Care, that's currently being utilized throughout North America and also heavily in the GTA to promote and align our equity efforts with other healthcare organizations. Care data will become HHS's term for health equity or social determinant of health data. Recognizing that we will need to expand on race, ethnicity, and language data at some point, we've settled on encapsulating all of this data as CARE data, which stands for Collecting Accurate and Robust Equity Data. This data will help us to better understand the patients that we care for and the experiences that they have within our hospitals. It'll also help us to disrupt racism and discrimination and identify where systemically this is showing up in our hospitals. As well, this will help us to implement the appropriate interventions and also help us to look at the evaluation methods to make sure that our interventions are actually making a difference in an effort to improve the quality and access to care for all of our patients. Next slide, please. So you might be asking yourself, well, why are we doing this? And this is because we simply cannot possibly provide the best care for all without truly knowing who we are providing care for and who we are not. Everyone should have the opportunity to be as healthy as possible, yet many face unfair disadvantages that threaten their health due to, but not limited to, race, gender, education, and socioeconomic factors, just to name a few. So looking towards equity deserving communities who tend to be the most at risk of experiencing disparities within our healthcare system, which ultimately results in higher risk of adverse, uh, adverse events as well as negative health outcomes. So identifying where these inequities exist within our organization is incredibly important and then developing a plan to address them can only be done if the data, if we have the data to support that work. Next slide, please. So with that, we are leveraging the work of Dr. April Cam and the Solutions for Patient Safety team. And we've begun collecting care data at the Boris Clinic, as well as the Ron Joyce Children's Health Center for PDSA Cycle 1 with business clerks asking race, ethnicity, and language questions and entering those answers into the patient charts during the, the registration process. Asking these questions will become standard of work for all of our for business clerks, um, but will not be mandatory for our patients to provide this information. Patients will have the ability to also enter this data on their own through my chart. Now, these are pilot areas and they will be used to help improve and inform our process in order to scale more broadly throughout the organization and throughout various areas of our hospital and will help to determine the expansion of care data um, to include additional socio demographic data points as this pilot continues to evolve. There's also extensive work ongoing with our community to inform the process, recognizing that this has been supported and encouraged by Ontario Health, Kai High, and the Human Rights Commission, as well as various other community organizations. Next slide, please. So patients may be curious about the, the pilot and may have many questions when visiting our sites. So it's important for us to explain to our patients why we are collecting this information and listen to any feedback that we get and that we receive from our patients and uh, family. It's also important that these questions are asked in a respectful manner 
without making assumptions about how our patients will answer. It's also important that we reiterate to patients and families that responding to care data questions is confidential and voluntary. Next slide, please. So resources are available to support the implementation of this pilot and are provided to staff and physicians via the hub, where you can find further information like frequently asked questions, posters, and information brochures for patients and families. And as always, if you have questions or feedback, please feel free to email inclusion at hhsc.ca. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the work of the Cross-Functional Health Equity Data Collection Working Group, as well as our provincial partners who have been instrumental in getting us to this point. Um, so really want to acknowledge the great work that's been happening within our hospital and also through the partnerships that we've been developing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Rochelle, for the update on that important work. Uh, many have contributed and it's really uh, advancing quite well. Um, okay, so our, uh, well, I'm introducing myself. So I'm going to give a quick update for everyone on the upcoming 2023 My Voice Matters engagement survey. As you know, this, uh, this survey is now done annually. We started last year to bring it back into an every year survey across the organization for all of our staff, physicians, residents, fellows, uh, everyone can fill out the survey. It is 100% uh, confidential. It's also voluntary. Uh, everyone's going to receive a link starting on Monday, October 23rd, inviting you to participate uh, in this year's engagement survey. And it, it should take you no more than 15 minutes to fill out. I know it's very hard in everyone's work day to find time uh, for such things, as well as breaks and, and, and lunch and and whatnot. So, but it's super important if you can find the opportunity uh, in your day to fill out this survey. It's a really influential tool uh, and really relied upon. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the survey will close on November 20th, so it gives us about a month to fill it out, and we'll we'll have reminders throughout that time period for everybody. Uh, and as well, we're going to have some prizes too. So uh, maybe to the next slide, please. I guess in terms of, you may ask yourself, well, you know, why should I fill out the survey? Why should I give 15 minutes of my time for that? Really, this year, as we thought about it, we would ask you, if not your input, then whose? You you and your voice and your experience matters a great deal. And, and I can say that, you know, last year and this year, I'll be reporting to our board of directors on the feedback that's received from the survey. That includes uh, the aggregate results, as well as the commentary. I know that a lot of our leaders as they think about trying to uh, launch improvement projects, plan for the year. Uh, they're also looking to the survey data in their area and, and their site and, and the broader organization and trying to see where there's opportunities and, and, and they're asking for detailed analysis. So the survey is very widely used. It's, it's a touchstone for all of our initiatives. It may not say exactly what we're going to do in a given year, but it influences the way we prioritize, the way that resources are allocated to projects, and maybe even the way, the order in which things are done. I know that the uh, work underway now in our equity, diversity, and inclusion plan has been a really prioritized. We're, we're, we're undertaking a sweeping review of HHS policies with an EDI lens, largely because of the emphasis that came through in the survey. We know it's vital work to do, but I think it got renewed uh, significance and importance in terms of what our workforce is demanding uh, we undertake as an organization and that's been heard and it's been actioned i would say also there's work that's been underway in the last year around wellness programs our emphasis on psychological safety and culture teamwork uh, how we're communicating with the organization the frequency we do it the ways we do it the topics that are brought forward the emphasis on leadership and recognition uh, Anyways, we put a lot of this information available on the hub so you can look at it, uh, but this is how you can influence the way that our hospital grows uh, and improves as an organization, offer a perspective on what you're experiencing in the work you're doing every day, which, which we know is super challenging. So this year, as every year, is very important. Your feedback is vitally important. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, the prizes part. Okay, so we will, as we have in the past, we, we do have prizes for teams that have completed the survey together. Uh, and then your team is entered uh, into the draw for weekly prizes. If you, you know, if you, uh, every week, if your team has completed the survey, you're entered in the subsequent draw. So more opportunity, uh, the sooner teams as a group can complete the survey. There will also be individual prizes uh, for those complete, uh, completing the survey, uh, running the range from, I know we have an iPad, we've had iPods in the past, uh, or ear pods in the past, excuse me, as well as gift cards for our concession stands. Uh, so please participate, uh, not for the prizes, but because of the importance of your voice. Your voice does matter a great deal. Uh, and you can email the inbox, the My Voice Matters at hhsc.ca. If you have questions or if your survey link doesn't come through, we know sometimes we miss uh, some folks and want to make sure that we can correct that as quickly as we can. Uh, so that's the update today on our My Voice Matters survey. I really hope uh, you'll participate and send your feedback through that forum. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving forward in our agenda. Uh, next up, I'm going to invite George Pankew, who is our Director of Capital Development, but also this year our campaign co-chair for the HHS United Way campaign to tell us a little bit about what's going on with that campaign and what we need to know. George, over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, just, yeah, our other co-chair is Brian Herchuk, just so everybody knows that. So uh, this year's campaign has kicked off uh, and our goal for this year is to raise $75,000. So um, we're hoping we can get there um, and with everybody's support. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Kira McDermott, who's the Manager of Resource Development for the United Way of Halton and Hamilton, and she's going to provide us a short presentation on the workers of the United Way. Uh, over to you, Kira. Thanks so much, George. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kira. I am your staff partner from United Way. Um, and to start off, I really want to share just a huge thank you to everyone at HHS for your hugely successful campaign in 2022. Collectively, you raised over $73,000, and I wanted to take a moment and share the success that you contributed to. So last year, United Way Holton and Hamilton supported over 140,000 individuals at 57 agencies through 106 different programs. This impact would not have been possible without your generosity. So again, I just say a huge thank you for supporting our community. While acknowledging the amazing success of last year's campaign and the essential supports it was able to provide to individuals across Holton and Hamilton, our work is not yet done. Our community's needs are growing at an alarming rate and they require our support more than ever. United Way funded agencies can be that support for our neighbors, but they need support. We know that 68% of programs supported by United Way are experiencing increased demand with 49% of them having wait lists. And this looks like individuals waiting for mental health supports, food security programs, or a safe place to send their children after school. These figures highlight the urgency of our situation in our community and the critical role that you can play in addressing these challenges. So how can you contribute? The HHS campaign runs for the month of October. Um, and the number one way you can make a difference is through a financial donation as your resources allow. So this year, donations above $5 a pay or 130 in a one-time donation are eligible for, for raffle tickets with prizes like uh, tickets to a Leafs game, um, Chai Cats tickets, a brewery tour, retail gift cards, and more. And the more you donate, uh, the more tickets that you will get. So please consider donating through the link sent to your email. The Bullathon is back on October 26th, so please consider entering a team and participating. It should be a really great event. Um, and this year, I'm really excited to announce that your gift to United Way Halton and Hamilton goes further thanks to the local love community match. So for every $4 donated, one will be matched by generous community members and organizations. And this applies to payroll donations, one-time donations, as well as any funds raised through the Bolathon. So this means that you'll have an even bigger impact on our community and help more people uh, improve their lives here locally in Hamilton and Halton. So please look for your link to donate in your email and consider how you can show some local love to our neighbors who need our support. I invite you today to consider starting to donate, matching what you donated last year, or even increasing your donation as your resources allow to help United Way help our community to survive the challenges our society is facing. If there's any questions, 
I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I just say a big thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for supporting our community. Uh, thank you, Kira, for that presentation. So we're hoping everyone will contribute. Uh, and don't forget to register your team for the Bolathon. If you had registered last year and since it was canceled, uh, you still have to re-register. So uh, back to you, Aaron. Yeah, thanks a ton, uh, George and Kira, for that information about the campaign. Just a reminder to everyone that uh, I know we've had two questions today, and I think we're still trying to get a firm answer on one of them, but the uh, opportunity to ask questions does not stop uh, with today's town hall. You can always uh, pose your questions at hhsnews at hhsc.ca uh, as well. Any suggestions you have for this format or topics you'd like to see covered. Uh, so uh, now we can move to our celebrations portion of our agenda. Just a reminder to everybody that you can use the chat forum to type a celebration and we'll read it out uh, here. You can also raise your hand and we'll call on you to give your shout out live. That includes our participants as well as our panelists. And I see a hand up right now, Sandy Lloyd with a hand out. Uh, so Sandy, please go ahead and ask or give, you, give your shout out. <laughs> what would you like to celebrate today? Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I will shout out, I will shout out, I will do a shout out to um, all of the uh, project team members that are involved in the uh, scheduling and timekeeping call for project. We've had great engagement from everyone, from frontline staff, and just a big shout out to everyone that's been involved today. That's good. See, maybe I should do that more often, just call on participants <laughs> to give their shout out, but what an important one you've given. That's vital work underway uh, to revitalize our scheduling platform, for sure. Thanks for raising that, and thanks for giving that celebration. Susan Pucciarelli, you have your hand up. What would you like to celebrate today? I do. Thank you, Erin. Um, I just want to thank uh, formerly Melissa Cummings and Natalie Pluzzini and everyone that's been involved in bringing us a wide variety of activities for Healthy Workplace Month in October. Um, please take a look at the hub so that you can see the array of activities and uh, things that we have planned for you. There's Walktober, there are lunchtime presentations, including a work and burnout for healthcare providers, which is a free webinar on October the 17th at 12 o'clock. We have a pumpkin decorating contest. Um, and then of course, plus our ongoing pet therapy and our very important partnership with the YMCA. So please take a look at the, the hub for those different activities to sign up for. And uh, we wish you all a healthy and safe, healthy workplace month. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, okay, I see Leslie Gillies with a hand up. Leslie, what would you like to celebrate today? Thanks, Aaron. Two celebrations, actually. First, thanks um, and sincere congratulations to the West Lincoln team uh, in celebration of their one year anniversary of obstetrics return to the site. So well done. And uh, that was uh, an excellent uh, recognition of everyone's hard work. Uh, also, uh, congratulations as well to the uh, lower limb preservation team who uh, had their official launch October 3rd of this program. This is an OH program, uh, but specifically many, many partners. But uh, thank you to Danielle Petricelli, Tina Petrelli, and uh, Dan Van Neen, uh, who are really uh, leading the way. Thank you very much. Awesome. Hey, I'll just, just I, Tim, I see your hand up. I'm just going to read out a couple of the comments here before we go to you. I see from uh, Kira, just a thanks uh, to everybody for having her here today and an email address if you'd like to reach out to Kira at United Way to learn more about the campaign. Uh, from Jem Bed, uh, congratulations to all the business clerks that are participating in the CARE project. For sure, thanks for acknowledging their participation and, and vital role in bringing that to life. From Raman Sidhu, Shout out to facilities team at all sites, especially Nader from JCC for all the support towards Every Child Matters flags. Awesome. Thanks very much, Raman. From Daniela Traiani, not sure if mentioned, it's also Occupational Therapy Month. So not yet, but thanks, Daniela, for calling that. I have a happy Occupational Therapy Month. Uh, from Jordan Kloss, massive kudos for the Willow team. They keep fixing the break fixes, solving our pharmacy tickets, and are plugging away with optimization projects. 
sure they're really glad to hear that from you, Jordan. Thanks for calling that out today. Um, okay, Tim, why don't we go to you next? What would you like to celebrate today? Thanks very much, Aaron. Yeah, I think the last town hall was before accreditation, so I, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge, as Rob said at the beginning, uh, all the efforts from uh, across all of our accreditation teams at HHS for a successful uh, on-site survey. And uh, although there was so many people that contributed, uh, and I can't possibly cover them all, I do believe we need to recognize the work of Brian Herchuk, Steve French, and especially Ron Movilla, who was the point person for our accreditation efforts. So thanks to all and thanks to uh, those folks uh, specifically. And I'd also like to call out um, uh, recognition for uh, long service, Roseanne Zimmerman celebrating 40 years at Hamilton Health Sciences this month. So congratulations, Roseanne. Amazing, thank you. Congratulations, Roseanne, for sure. And uh, as well, thanks to all the accreditation team uh, and everyone that participated and did all of the work for that very successful endeavor. Uh, okay, uh, Susan has another congratulations to Janice Jaskolka uh, for delivering an excellent presentation at the National CRE MSD Conference on Monday, acknowledging the work done by our ERGO team on safe patient handling. Well done. Great, thank you. Thanks, Janice. Uh, to uh, from Karen Margallo, celebrating Laura Babb, clinical manager with the Pediatric Ambulatory Clinics, celebrating her 35 years at HHS this month, uh, as well as today being her last official day. Congrats on retirement, Laura, and thanks uh, for your 35 years of service to HHS and our community. That's really great. From Don Mallow, happy, happy Cyber Security Awareness Month. And, and with that, a note, please check your credentials, reset your passwords, and set up multi-factor authentication wherever it's supported. Cybersecurity Awareness Month and uh, an important note. Thanks, Dawn, for shouting that out today. Okay, we'll do one last call. Leslie, I still see a hand up. Is that from before? Is it something new? That is my mistake. I will put it. Okay, that's just a high five for the moderator, I suppose. Thanks for that. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for being a part of today's town hall. I'll turn it over to Rob for closing thoughts. Thanks, Aaron, and I'll give you a high five uh, here as well. Um, and so thanks all for joining today, our next town hall, uh, November the 2nd. In the meantime, you'll continue to receive updates on hospital operations through the usual channels. Would reiterate the uh, admonishment, the encouragement to participate in this year's United Way campaign. It's uh, really in all of our interests that you do that. Uh, and finally, thanks everyone again for all the work you're doing, uh, especially during these very challenging times. See you all soon. Cheers.